Our next and final speaker is well known to just about everybody in this room. Over the past year, of course, Senator Ron Wyden has made headlines and become known to millions of rank and file internet users and social networking users as the leading congressional voice in opposition to the controversial legislation PIPA and SOPA, which has been mentioned several times already tonight. But Senator Wyden's remarkable track record on technology issues goes back many, many years, and the debt that users of today's online social networks owe to him is much greater than most probably realize. All the way back in 1995, when the internet was just starting to become popular with the general public, Senator Wyden, or excuse me, then Representative Wyden, had the foresight to co-author what's become a crucial cornerstone of the online environment. Section 230, the provision that ensures that an online service provider can allow users to post content without risking liability for everything those users do. Without section, as the, as, the, as the applause indicates, without Section 230, the internet today would be a very different place. And Senator Wyden has remained at the cutting edge of technology policy ever since, from his Internet Tax Freedom Act, to digital signatures legislation, to spam. He was an early proponent of online privacy legislation and an early proponent of internet neutrality as well. And he's a leading voice for civil liberties, from his concerns about Patriot Act implementation to his latest bill on geolocation privacy. On a more personal note, I had the great privilege of working on Senator Wyden's staff for a number of years. And seeing him in action every day I was consistently inspired by his relentless energy, his commitment to principled policymaking, and his determination to work on a bipartisan basis to get actual things done and make real, tangible progress. In short, it's hard to imagine a more effective legislator. Not just the people of Oregon, but internet users everywhere are lucky to have him in the Senate. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Oregon's Senator Ron Wyden. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. What, 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 what an inflationary introduction. And despite what David was saying, until very recently, I was barely a household word in my own household. So, David, thank you very, very much. And it's a treat to be here at, at Tech Prom. Unfortunately, even though it is a prom, I had to come stag tonight. <laughs> Fortunately, as David mentioned, looking back at some of these fights, I had a little bit of experience going it alone. So, <laughs> But I'm, I'm thrilled to have a chance to be with all of you. I was asked by, uh, by Leslie, the inimitable Leslie. Let's give her a big round of applause for all the great work that she and Deidre do. Leslie asked me to kind of offer a mini poetic filibuster tonight, kind of getting into the details about the domain name system and DNSSEC and all the stuff that's going to be part of the next round of uh, the online copyright battles. But I was going to spend just a few minutes uh, tonight, I know it, it's late, and particularly not make you feel so bad about not being at South by Southwest. <laughs> Here's what you missed in Austin. Today there was a long panel entitled, quote, The Last 100 Years of Awesomeness. Yeah, um, awesome. Not DNS, you know, sec. By the way, was Gigi Sohn there? Where is Gigi Sohn? Gigi's here. So, kind of put this in perspective. That dubious panel was followed by one called, I quote here, sexy data solutions for public transit systems. <laughs> Sexy was 
Paul Vixie on that panel? <laughs> Again, you know, obviously not. Then there was a panel called, quote, Beyond Dance, Dance, Revolution. <laughs> and of course, everybody wants to know what that revolution, you know, holds. And then there was also, I was particularly interested in seeing if I could get the kind of transcript on this, there was what amounts to a remedial panel for politicians, <laughs> and it was called How to Misuse the Internet and Make People Love You. <laughs> so you didn't miss much. You are lucky to be here tonight. And besides, I guess they had tacos and barbecue and beer, and there was also a cell phone reception. So... Um, I'm not going to discuss DNS, you know, sec, and um, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes looking back on where we are. By the way, I really appreciate not getting some kind of lifetime achievement, you know, award. <laughs> that, like, drives home this kind of question of senators and their age. My older daughter made me feel a little bit, you know, better. I think many of you know my wife owns the Strand Bookstore, one of the country's great uh, bookstores, and we had all the older and the younger recently, and my older daughter said, Dad, I figured it out. You are in the only profession on earth where somebody your age is actually one of the young guys. So I really appreciate not getting, Leslie, this, you know, Lifetime Achievement Award. And just kind of a quick sort of step back memory lane, and, and I think Brad made some very important points on, on innovation, and, and a couple thoughts about where we're going um, from here. When we were working on the Communications Decency Act, nobody ever said back then, hey, thanks to us, Someday the world is going to be able to express itself 140 characters at a time. <laughs> Nobody had any thoughts like that. Our big concern, and it really drove so much of those early days, and Jerry Berman was there, and Danny was there, and so many of you, we just didn't want to mess it up. We just didn't want to make mistakes and particularly get in the way of promising, you know, innovations. And we said, look, if we're going to stick it to intermediaries during those early you know, days, that would make it hard, that would make it difficult for people to get a sense of their innovations paying off. And that was really the origins of Section 230, is we wanted to empower you know, the families. Danny remembers this. And we talked about how we were against SMUT too. We just didn't want to try to create some big government kind of program that would impede uh, innovation. And I think we got that, that right. We're certainly pleased about what's happened in Oregon. We're thrilled that Facebook is in Oregon, you know, for, for example. Uh, you look back, uh, David's, uh, David's family and, you know, in our state, you know, where not very long ago, not very long ago, people sort of lived with timber and nat natural, you know, resources. It's been a tremendous transformation and a transformation, you know, for the good. And that kind of led to electronic signatures and net neutrality and, we wanted a tax policy that just ensured there wasn't discrimination, and you just stacked one sort of building block after another uh, in place, and along came PIPA and SOPA. And as I thought about it back in 2010, when I put the first hold, the hold on COICA, which was the predecessor of PIPA and SOPA, and we did that, and the fall of 2010, and frankly, if we hadn't done it then, we would have essentially seen COICA slash PIPA slash SOPA become law in 2010 because the Congress wasn't part of it. And we said, you know, if that kind of effort becomes law, we're going to unravel everything that you all built over the last 15 years. We're going to start unraveling Section 230. We're going to start unla unraveling net neutrality and non-discrimination, some of these kind of core sort of uh, principles. 
And that's what we really looked at in terms of those early days of the Pippa and Sopa uh, fight. And I know it really, as things played out, began to become something else, where, in effect, people said, oh, this is just two big powers, sort of a battle of two powerful interests, one that was hurt by the internet and one that was making money you know, online. And we kept coming back to say, that's not what this is about at all. This is about picking up on what Brad's talking about, and that's innovation. And innovation for everybody. What I think drove so much of the concern at the grassroots you know, level is lots of people just felt behind. They felt locked out, and it came to be that government doesn't promote innovation by stepping in to protect the old businesses who are trying to hold off the new ones. And as we got a chance to actually explain it, as people started to do online you know, videos, and we began in some of the hearings in my subcommittee, the International uh, Trade and Competitiveness uh, Subcommittee, uh, on finance to explain it and talk about transformation. It wasn't very long ago in the Senate you know, Finance Committee, the idea of digital you know, commerce you know, being you know, discussed was about like growing a second head. I mean, people thought of commerce as essentially moving trucks and steel and lumber. I don't take a backseat to anybody in terms of promoting those industries. But we said, here is a chance to suddenly talk about a new dimension. And we were talking about cloud computing. We were talking about you know, digital uh, goods. And we said, apropos of Brad's you know, point, that innovation is really all about making sure that those people who have felt you know, left behind and saw the internet as the great equalizer would see opportunities in the years ahead, even when they didn't have money, even when they didn't have lobbyists, even when they didn't have an array of you know, talent, at least by kind of Washington standards. At one point, I said, you know, it looks like everybody in the content you know, industry, when they're lobbying, goes out and hires a bunch of Congress people to defend them, and somebody piped up on our side at one of those inimitable meetings that Leslie went to, and they said, well, that's OK. We hire geeks. <laughs> and at the same time, people saw this campaign building and, and building, and we came to kind of make an argument about what we wanted our future to be all about. And on one hand, you've got a future, in effect, uh, as seen through the prism of China, which governs itself to protect existing you know, political power, doesn't, innovative in, doesn't innovate much to compete, and basically resorts to state-sponsored economic power, economic blackmail, and commercial protectionism. They go out and knock off the rest of the world's products, but folks, they aren't innovating anything new. Then you contrast what I've just described as the internet, this place where if you don't have the money, don't have the clout, but you have a good idea, you can take off. Which future do you want to be part of? Which future do you want to subscribe to? China and essentially a protectionism ethic from sort of beginning to end in terms of how they drive their commercial uh, investments or something built around the innovations and the opportunities that we all know comes from embracing uh, the net. So I think we know what we ought to be trying to do with respect to innovation, and I want to close with just a couple of uh, comments about the Congress. First, if we're going to get the Congress to be serious about innovation, to welcome new entrants rather than crowd them out, I think we ought to be thinking about a couple of common sense principles. First, the Congress should not be trying to ram through legislation that isn't well known and understood. If you don't want the country to be suspicious, 
if you don't want the country to be suspicious of your legislation, then don't spring it on legislators at the last minute. Don't use the committee process and avoid opportunities for debate and thoughtful and diverse opinion. And don't rush the bill to the floor of the United States uh, Senate and say national so security and stopping thievery calls for its immediate passage. I believe that Americans are going to be suspicious about what isn't explained to them and what they're not allowed to participate in as a result of the last few months. January 18th, that Wednesday, changed the norm here in Washington, D.C. It's just that simple. January 18th, 2012, brought a new norm to Washington, D.C. And as a part of that uh, new norm, I think we're going to have to be able to lay out very specific ways in which we want an openness and accountability that we haven't uh, had before. I learned uh, this past week we had Ambassador Kirk before the Senate Finance Committee. I had, to, had an opportunity to ask him some questions about the Trans-Pacific you know, Partnership Agreement, which a lot of you know, people, both with respect to ACTA and the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, basically see as an international version of PIPA and SOPA. And I asked Ambassador uh, Kirk about the process for involving uh, the public because I've become increasingly concerned about what some of the accounts are of the process. And he basically defended a system that says you've got to go out and get a security clearance to see essentially the internet policy and intellectual property provisions of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Now, he said it was kind of top secret and there were a whole lot of security interests and I volunteered that I was on the Intelligence Committee and <laughs> I kind of deal with kind of top secret materials from you know, time to time and I said, Mr. Ambassador, we respect that. But the people that have been concerned about these issues, that are concerned about internet freedom, are not going to buy the idea that they've got to get a security clearance in order to see the text of a particular agreement that involves policy. And I said, we can work out provisions that ensure that classified matters that touch on uh, national security and, and interests in, in that area are, are, are protected. And I think that's a very uh, specific um, issue that we ought to be looking at as, as well, is how are we going to promote openness in these specific policy areas that are going to keep coming up again and again. In my home state, one out of seven jobs depends on international trade. The president has made a prime feature of his economic plan, a policy to significantly promote exports. We're not going to be able to do it in a process that's going to make people confident if they hear that they're going to have to go out and get a security you know, clearance uh, to participate in the most important um, discussions. In it. And the last uh, point is I still think an awful lot of the Congress looks to social media as sort of a place to paste press releases. And <laughs> this is different, folks. This is interactive. This is a process of give and take where you can't just get up and read a wonderful talk that's been prepared for your staff. My staff's written nine or ten pages. It's beautiful. If you want it, I'll put it in the congressional record and mail it to you. <laughs> but what I've tried to do is tell you what I really think on the basis of 15 wonderful years of working with you. And we've got a lot more to do. I'm very hopeful that Chairman Baucus is going to look at some of the opportunities in the Senate Finance Committee uh, for hearings and further uh, discussions and the chance for us to build on what we've been part of these last uh, 15 years. I was thinking coming over here uh, about a one, what a wonderful ride it has been for me. Uh, for those of you that don't know much about my uh, background, I grew up 
uh, dreaming of playing in the National Basketball Association. That was a really delusional proposition. <laughs> because I was too small and I made up for it by being slow. <laughs> I went to the same, I played at the same high school Jeremy Lin did, so now once in a while somebody asks me about basketball, I can ride, <laughs> ride his coattails. But growing up, I never ever thought that someone like myself would have these opportunities for public service. I get to represent the very best state in the country. A state that is always on the cutting edge, not just of inter uh, internet freedom, but the environment. We were the first to be serious about talking about the health care choices that are ahead. I never, ever thought growing up, a first generation Jewish kid with a face for radio, <laughs> I never thought that I would have these opportunities for public service, number one. I never thought that I'd be sitting next to Leslie with Danny and Jerry and David and all the people in this room after a 15-year ride for a cause that I think is not only just. I think the cause that is represented in this room, and I know not everybody agreed about Pippa and Sopa and their certainly reasonable differences, and in Washington, D.C., there are no final victories. <laughs> but I'll tell you, and it was really what I wanted to convey tonight as part of you know, my comments, I think the work that is being done by people in this room puts this country on the right side of history, puts innovation on the right side of freedom and ec economic opportunity, Thank you, thank you, thank you for a wonderful 15-year ride, and I look forward to partnering with all of you in the days ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.